Hello and welcome to Joy in Our Town. I'm Sherry Duckworth and joining me today is Dr. Sid O'Brien. He is Associate Professor for the UNT Health Science Center. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Uh, Dr. O'Brien, um, we're here to talk about dementia and Alzheimer's and um, you know, I've been touched by this in my life, friends and family members who have suffered um, with both. Um, and it's a very difficult uh, subject. It's very personal and it's very difficult. Um, and we don't ever want to have anybody in our lives obviously suffer from either, um, but it does happen. So it's good for us to be educated on yeah. what to look for. Um, so can we start there today? What are some signs of Alzheimer's and dementia? And actually, if you can kind of describe it as the difference between the two. Right. So dementia, it, this is a common question. So dementia is the umbrella term. Dementia is the catch-all term. Right. Alzheimer's is one type of dementia. It also happens to be approximately 70 plus percent of all dementia cases. So there can be other types of dementia, dementia due to Parkinson's disease and head injury and other things. Right. Some of the earliest signs of Alzheimer's disease are forgetting new things. It's memory problems. But the misconception oftentimes is that it's memory for things in the past, and it's not. Oftentimes, Alzheimer's patients, they'll retain those, those older memories for longer time. It's learning new things. So grocery list, forgetting what to buy at the store, mm -hmm. forgetting that someone called, forgetting telephone numbers. Um, also things like having trouble with words. That can be an early symptom of the diseases. Uh, patients, uh, you know, our loved ones will be speaking and all of a sudden they can't come up with the words, so they talk around it, those sorts of things. So they can be, those can be early signs and even things like behavioral changes, depression. Sometimes patients are aware they're changing and, and uh, their, their things change and they start to kind of withdraw a little bit. Sometimes depression is one of the earlier symptoms. I've also heard sometimes that they can become violent in some ways. Yes, yes, and that's... The number one reason for patients diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease to end up in an institution sort of setting is because of the behavioral problems that can happen. Yeah. Uh, I've also been touched personally by this, and you know, my grandmother fortunately didn't have behavioral problems. She actually just became happier, it appeared. Yeah. But sometimes patients get violent, or all of a sudden it's someone who's never spoken a derogatory word cusses. and. It's disturbing. It's very disturbing to the family because they just, they get, they're not sure what to do. Now, I mean, we were joking before we started today about how, you know, as a mother, I sometimes I think, oh no, I have early onset or something because I don't remember anything. Um, but obviously it's not, all, it's not a joking matter. We do joke a lot about memory loss, but how do we know the difference between, you know, uh, just a mom with a lot of my mind right. to, you know, what if? What if? Right. So... <clears throat> yeah, I know what that, you know, I have two kids myself <laughs> and uh, busy work and, and we get pulled into many different directions and sometimes we have trouble keeping up with things. With aging, uh, the number one thing that actually goes with our capacity from a memory and thinking standpoint is our ability to process information. We basically, we take things in and process it slower. Think of it as your CPU it's a little slower than it used to be. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we're not, we don't attend to things as well as we used to, which if you're not processing it and you're not attending to it, you can't possibly remember it because it never got in there. Right. But memory is actually normally okay with aging if, if someone actually is attending to it. So it's that with age, we do get slower, not only physically, uh, but, but <laughs> we, we slow down as how we get information in. Okay. That's normal. When people can't remember things, when, you know, forgetfulness is one thing, but if all of a sudden this person can't go shopping without a list at all, or if they go and they lose their list, now all of a sudden they can't function. So basically they just blank out. They, they completely lose the memory of things. And, you know, sometimes we all just don't remember something. But when someone is consistently not remembering things a lot, and if it is somehow different than what it used to be and it's impacting their life, they really need to get an evaluation. Okay. What does the evaluation normally look like? So it's, it's a difficult thing right now because 
a comprehensive evaluation requires a specialty clinic. So a medical exam by a physician who is an expert in dementia syndromes. But then also testing of memory and thinking, blood test, a brain scan to rule out other things. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's complex uh, and it's quite expensive. Uh, and, but there are places in the Metroplex, actually some very good places, so at least we're in a location where it can happen. And what I tell people all the time is if you think something's going on, be your advocate and you know, make sure your, your health care provider gets you referred on. But it requires a lot. It's, it's difficult, um, you know, for the loved ones of somebody to watch this going on and happening and you notice the changes. So approaching them with it is very, um, it can be very sensitive and very delicate subject. Yes, and, and so from a personal experience with that, I am the one who had to help my family mm. push forward a diagnosis for a loved one. And I can tell you it was, it was terribly difficult. Um, didn't even want to listen to me, and I'm an expert in it. Right. Um, so it's, it's sensitive. But it's one of those things in the Alzheimer's world where where we were with cancer 30 years ago where we didn't tell people they had cancer or AIDS 15, 20 years ago. We didn't tell people. We're at that point with Alzheimer's because... We have to move forward. We have to realize people need to know. They need to be able to plan. And then we can actually move forward for finding better treatments. I like that you say, you know, we need to plan. Because a lot of the times people just think, oh, no, this is happening. We're just going to take it a day at a time. But having, how important is it, especially with having a personal experience, yeah. how important is it for them to have a plan in place while... Um, their loved one is able to be a part of that process. That's huge. That is absolutely huge. Um, by training, I'm actually a psychologist. And so quality of life mm. and dignity of, of patients and, and our loved ones to me is top priority. And I can tell you out of thousands of people I've seen, I've never had a patient come to me and say, Dr. O'Brien, I want my kids to do my financial and my legal affairs. People want to take care of their own affairs, and they need to be involved early in the process. That's very, very important for that quality of life and for them to remain that they need to hold on to that dignity. Most definitely. Now, obviously, none of us ever want to be in this boat. You know, we never want to hear, just like we don't want to hear cancer, HIV. Right. We don't want to hear Alzheimer's either. Um, are there ways to prevent mm -hmm. Alzheimer's? So that's a big, big thing right now. People are trying to ways, find ways to prevent it. What, right now, what the science would suggest is there are things associated with reducing your risk. Mm -hmm. And things like keeping your diabetes under control, keeping your blood pressure under control, keeping your cholesterol under control, staying physically active, eating a healthy diet. Well, all of those things sound familiar to everybody because it's keeping your heart healthy. Exactly. A healthy heart is a healthy brain. Interesting. Um, but then also staying mentally and socially active. So that's the part that I have trouble with with most elderly men because they retire and then they just kind of yeah. sit around. They don't want to get out. I was meeting <laughs> with someone yesterday and had that discussion. I telling them, hey, you got to get out your house and go actually talk to people. Yeah. That, but those things are very good. Uh, and the, the science suggests that doing those things in physical activity, exercise, may actually be one of the biggest ones. Uh, but they, they may help reduce risk. So remain social, do some exercise, mm -hmm. stay active. Yes. Um, don't be a cave dweller just because you retire. Right. <laughs> get out right. there. Get out there in the world. Experience it still. Exactly. Um, we talked about heart health, but what about emotional health? Mm -hmm. How is that related to um, encouraging, I guess, uh, the onset of Alzheimer's? It's very important. Depression is a very strong risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Um, stress. Stress is bad for us, again, to the heart health things. Right. But chronic stress is also really bad for our mental health. Uh, so we have to do things like we were talking earlier. We have to get sleep. And if we're really chronically, emotionally stressed and drained, we don't get that. Uh, so things that can reduce your your uh, emotional load, so to speak. Uh, so we're getting trying to get depression treated, if people are anxious, trying to get that dealt with, um, very good for our brain. So emotional health, heart health, sleep. I love that one. That's my favorite right there. <laughs> Make sure you get plenty of sleep. Absolutely. <laughs>
very important, um, helps with keeping Alzheimer's at bay. Yes. Okay, that's good to know. Um, an accurate diagnosis of Alzheimer's, because you talked about dementia as the umbrella. So it could be something else. Yes. So how do we know that we're getting an accurate diagnosis? That's why I mentioned earlier the specialty clinics. Um, what happens oftentimes is we see uh, patients who their primary care providers are excellent and they're taking care of their health, but they just don't know about these dementia things. Right. And that's those comprehensive evaluations are really the only way to get an accurate diagnosis. Um, there are new things that are coming out. Uh, there's now a way to do brain pictures that might be that are very accurate, but also they're PET scans, so they're very expensive. Yes. Uh, and our group actually is working on a blood test for the disease, which is incredibly accurate. So hopefully we'll be able to help primary care docs know who to get on to that specialist pretty soon, ways to help that out. That's really interesting just to go in and get a blood test. Yeah. And how new is that? Uh, so we've been working on it for a while. Uh, it's incredibly accurate right now. We've got some uh, actually, as of now, we're about 96 and 98 percent accurate wow, of saying whether right. someone has the disease or not. Yeah. And our goal is to get it to primary care providers. Mm -hmm. I mean, this isn't something that a specialty clinic needs. It's right. how to, it's just like we talk about cancer. How do you get to a, a cancer doc, an oncologist? Well, a blood test yeah. tells your primary care provider. So uh, we're actually trying to get it set up where we can at least test it in primary care clinics within the next 12 months or so. Wow, that's wonderful news. It'll definitely make it a lot easier for people to get diagnosed properly. Absolutely. Um, dementia is normal part of aging. Is it normal? I mean, we always joke as we get older, we become forgetful right. and all of these things, but is it a normal part of aging? It's not. No, uh, that is a misconception. And I actually, I don't even like the word dementia because uh, I work a lot with Spanish speaking populations and it's pejorative. I mean, it, you're calling someone crazy and that, but that's what people think when they hear the word it's not normal aging, and if our memory and thinking is changing, we need to get seen because there are things we can do. I think that's, it really places a challenge on us as a society because we feel like we can just kind of relax that part of our brain as we get older. Um, you know, we have all the excuses, I'm a mom, I'm right. getting older, we have, you know, whatever your excuse might be, but it's not normal. No. Absolutely not. And that's, to me, one of the most important things we need to get out there is that it's not normal. Because as soon as society understands that we should be maintaining our memory with age, not losing it. So once we get over that, that's when as a society we can say, OK, now we get it. Let's do something about it. What are some basic things that we can do to help our memory? You know, some of the great things are just staying active with your memory now and with your thinking. So, but what I tell people is don't do the same thing. So um, if you're a crossword puzzle person, well, that's really not challenging you anymore. And there's some interesting research, for example, on chess players. And so if you know someone who's in the early to mid stage of Alzheimer's disease, but they're a master chess player, they're still going to beat you because they remember <laughs> it. Because they remember it. Right. So do new things. So if you love doing crossword puzzles, try reading more or try a different brain game. You don't have to do the mental Olympics sort of things right. that are out there, but we need to do things that are different. So change it up. Absolutely. It up. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Brien, for being here today. We appreciate you and all that you've taught us. And we thank you all today for watching Joy in Our Town.